started yeah you can start now so um, i invite dr lakshmi shrikhande to chair this session uh, she has put energies on the pages of foxy backed by dynamic teams and she has held many positions of importance for the same um i also invite dr mangala gisar the past president of energies who is known for her brain power and uh, i welcome both of you to chair this session thank you suvarna good morning energies our much awaited ganacon has finally materialized before i proceed to introduce the dawn of euro ganacology let me just add one line about the dawn of energies friends do you want me to take her name i know she is none other than dr vaidehi marathi chaitanya and anuradha has already said everything about her but i just want to add one line that your three c's vaidehi your creativity your courage your compassion during these adverse times is simply commendable so now moving from one dawn to another just focus dr ajay rane on the full screen friends he deserves to be projected because i am not going to read this cv of uh, him i want audience because you all know him as a great academician as a researcher as a innovator as a mentor uh, ajay rane you are a mentor not a mentee since last so many years i am seeing you and you are a great orator but very few people know the other side of this ajay rane amo please focus dr ajay rane on the screen, uh, screen and don't share his cv slide so let me introduce this philanthropist side and a human being side of dr ajay rane with your kind permission ajay i am not going to read your 27 page bio data because you are known world over as a eurogynec guy but what i am introducing today is a male feminist who is fighting for gender equality not only in india and australia but the world wide and why i am calling him as a male feminist on this occasion of international women's week friends let me just give few highlights of his work which he is doing in the field of women's empowerment since last 20 years how many of you know that he is chair of figo fistula committee of figo he has trained more than 120 surgeons and he has helped them perform 1200 fistula surgeries in last 5 years friends he runs dr paula rane fistula award in kasturba gandhi hospital chennai which is the first fistula management ward in a government hospital it's a free of cost he is also chair figo genital trauma committee which is fighting to eradicate the female genital mutilation in the world by educating the masses and by advocating the changes in the law what connected ajay and me instantly when we met on a common platform is our passion for the work on female feticide how many of you know that he is a film producer as well he has produced a film called rewire boss meantime i tell audience about rewire please put the link in the chat box so that everyone can go and see as such you don't need the link also you just have to type r i w a y a t y a t in youtube and it's free of cost it's available friends a must see movie this movie has won so many awards it has won special jury award it has won the best upcoming film at jaipur uh, international film festival it has won awards at caro film festival and it has received 12 nominations at maverick movie awards he is also working with nobel peace prize winner dr mukwege in congo on female genital violence friends and ajay it's really commendable that you intend to work 3 months free of cost at kambo for these women he has fought and won to remove the luxury tax from tampon and pads in australia and he has set up 
free sanitary distribution kits in university so he is a padman also he works in the field of contraception also friends he is promoting implanton insertion in young aboriginal girls to prevent the preteen pregnancy he also runs the post graduate pg program in papua new guinea free of cost for last 10 years he has graduated 39 specialists friends he has trained more than 400 fellows in pelvic surgery and he runs free of cost a charity hospital in fiji chennai and tanzania so he is truly reaching out to the unreached hats off to you boss he is not only a padman he is a toilet man also he has a very big passion for providing hygienic toilets to the women across the world and he is running two projects towards this area he is running a dignity sanitation project where they are providing cheap foldable tents to women and so far friends he has provided 150000 units so that the women they don't have to go in the field at dawn and get uh, exposed themselves to all kinds of violence second is his passion about the study to prevent the recurrent uti by simply advocating the white direction that is from front to back like our indian jet system and wiping if we can advocate and join him in this passion we all can do a big service to our human kind in preventing uti so friends usually we felicitate the women's on the occasion of international women's day the month and week but he is one man friends who deserves the special appreciation as a tribute to his silent and relentless work to the women empowerment since last 20 years i know he is too humble and shy and this time i told him that i am not introducing your hero ganak side but i am introducing your this side to our audience because if even one or two persons are motivated in the audience to join hands it will be worth taking this initiative to introduce you in a other way so thank you friends now i invite dr ajay rane a great academician and a orator to take the floor and address the audience ajay the floor is yours thank you uh, before i share my screen um i have always called lakshmi rani lakshmi because she always comes on her horse and um she is always full of valor and confidence uh, and she has got this amazing ability to embarrass me i am not really easily embarrassed but um she she does that to me and that's why she is very special uh very very special to me and um i thank you very much for your very kind words i think you know more about me than my wife my secretary and my children put together so i think uh, that is in itself um hats off to you for for what you are um i would like to congratulate uh, nogs for um an amazingly unique uh program obviously uh by they have uh, met you for the first time congratulations in becoming the president uh thank you for connecting me with evita after 22 years um and um the, the rani lakshmi basically said that um, you know you have to talk about um protocols tips and tricks and in my normal style i'm going to completely ignore her so um we're just this is a ride that i want you to enjoy with me uh it is going to be a roller coaster it is going to be controversial uh but that is because we want to stimulate thinking i think um i totally get what evita said about protocols i totally get what um um uh, evita said about having good regimes but i also think that protocols dumb you down they stop you from thinking about the individual we look at everything as a mass but at the end of your knife is somebody's wife somebody's daughter somebody's mother an individualization of treatment using protocols is a better way than to just follow protocols rigidly so i'm a, i'm a slightly anti protocol person because it stops people thinking 
you've got to keep thinking and that is very important. I have to say uh, Pragati is on. So um, Pragati is very much the anatomy guru. So I don't know if she's gonna be bored with my first five minutes, which is great. Um, and then uh, Milind Shah and Kubre, they are both on. So the males are being represented as well. So I'm really happy about that. And finally, before I start my lecture, uh, Lakshmi, I think it is very important about what you have said. This is critical. And the critical part is we are extremely short of male feminists. Female feminism hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. We need male feminists. And so I want all my male colleagues to be diehard feminists fighting for women, their rights, their, um, their reproductive rights, uh, rights against violence, rights against injustice. Men have to join this fight. And so I am truly, truly honored that you felt it important to mention my name in International Women's Week because I really am on a crusade to try and get as many male feminists as possible. Yesterday, I was late today because I was actually having lunch with our Deputy Prime Minister about launching a national scheme for free distribution of tampons and pads to university students. So we have to take it to that next level. Anyway, um, enough of that. I'm gonna share screen. Um, is there anything that I have been, if I'm rude about anything, please excuse me. Uh, is, if anybody wants to say anything more, that's fine. I'll just set up my slides before anything else. I think, uh, yes, I think I'm pretty good here now. So um, if um, you are happy, uh, Madam Chairpersons, I would like to start my talk, if that's okay. Yes. Dr. Gisar, am I okay yes, to go? Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Carry on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. You. I decided to, um, let's see if this works. Good. I decided mm -hmm. to bring this, I was quite impressed by the, the extraordinary, and I think that's why I put that in my topic. Um, and I think the Nari is 100% extraordinary. Uh, as a man, I'm incapable of giving birth. As a man, I'm incapable of breastfeeding. As a man, I'm incapable of multitasking. As a man, I'm incapable of looking after children because the data is very clear. In a developing country, if a woman dies in childbirth, 50% of her children die within five years if they are below the age of three. Half her children are dead. If a man dies, nothing happens. That actually tells you the extraordinariness of women, especially in war, especially in famine. They remain extraordinary. They remain unbelievable. And that's why I'm proud to represent them if I can in my little way. But now we have to go on to, I think it was basics, Lakshmi, that you said the talk was, so now I'm going to bore you because all the topics you did not want to learn as a medical student, um, you're going to see in a minute. So when people talk about urogynecology, it is not about surgery only. Urogynecology, a urogynecologist looks after vaginal disease, which could be prolapse, sexual dysfunction, childbirth trauma, and it's prevention, um, lower urinary tract disease, incontinence, stress and urge, recurrent UTIs, painful bladder syndrome, fistulas, lower gastrointestinal tract, bowel dysfunction, evacuatory dysfunction, fecal incontinence, prevention of obstetric anal sphincter trauma, and other similar issues that affect women, including pelvic pain, levator spasm, screening for childbirth trauma, and of course, my pet is reconstructive surgery for women who have suffered genital trauma through rape and female genital mutilation. Unfortunately, 
It is also happening in India. And there is a great move by Foxy and Figo to actually get the laws changed in India. Because I think we, we have to do this as a symbolic gesture to give our women confidence that they can actually live in this country safely without no, someone not running behind them with a razor blade to cut their clitoris and their labia minoras. So here we go. This is the things that we don't like to hear. Who has done anatomy? Who has read Gray's Anatomy in the last one year? We're going to do anatomy. We're going to do physiology. We're going to do biochemistry. We are going to do microbiology. We're going to do pharmacology. We're going to do pathology. We're going to do preventive and social medicine. And we are going to do surgery. And we are going to do, uh, if I can, psychiatry is what I've written here. So we are going to touch all the worst subjects that we didn't want to do in as medical students. I mean, nobody liked biochemistry uh, and also probably PSM. But now you can see that it, pro it provides an amazingly large uh, focus of some of our research. I'm also mindful of the time. So I'm going to be a maximum of 30 minutes. And uh, if you can interrupt me, please, uh, Lakshmi, if I'm overgoing, uh, overtaking my time, please, I'd be really grateful. No, no, we have to have discipline. Academic discipline is very important when it comes to presenting lectures. Anyway, let's go. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the, the most important part is anatomy of the pelvis. Without anatomy of the pelvis, Urogynecology does not exist. You cannot do lower urinary tract urology. You cannot do lower urinary gastrointestinal surgery. You cannot do vaginal uh, or uterine surgery without anatomy. I want to simplify it because if you simplify it, you think better. Everything is a continuum, completely agree. But if you can break it down, like Gautam Buddha, I don't know whether you've ever seen him, this mudra, it's called the mudra. The mudra is about unraveling life one knot at a time. You always wonder why they have this. It is unraveling. So you want to unravel the, the so-called mystery of pelvic floor support one knot at a time so that when you actually see a patient, you can think, is this level one? Is this level two? Is this level three? Is it all levels? Is it level two anterior, level two posterior, level three anterior, level three posterior? So we want to look at levels. We want to look at stages. We want to look at correlation with symptoms. And then we should look at therapy. So unless you do levels, assessment of stages, correlation with symptoms, you cannot actually say that you've assessed the patient properly for urogynecological disorders. Now, something is not going well here, which is, oh no, it is, it is good. Um, so look, I've divided it very simply into three levels. The vagina is 10 centimeters long. That hasn't changed ever since women became bipedal homo sapiens. So we divide the vagina into three centimeters, three centimeters, three centimeters. The upper third, the middle third, the lower third. The upper third is the non-mobile part of the vagina. That is why it is supported by ligaments. Ligaments are strong. They hold the cervix. They don't want it to move back and forth. It's one of those elements that needs to be rigid. So uterosacral and cardinal ligaments form the critical ligaments that hold the cervix. The cervix is not really very well sus uh, suspended anteriorly. So a lot of people talk about the pubovesicular cervical ligaments, not as strong as the cardinal ligaments and the uterosacral ligaments. It is no surprise, therefore, that the uterus is being pulled backwards and being suspended in the pelvis so the body falls forward. Antiversion is a sign of good uterosacral 
cardinal ligament support. Retroversion may be one of the first signs of loss of support. So not necessarily always is retroversion pathological, but what I'm trying to say is nature meant the uterus to be held up in the upper third of the vagina. If these ligaments break, most of the times the symptoms are very, very mild. It is the reason why you see massive procedures. You think the patient doesn't feel the procedure? She does, but it's not truly bothersome for the patient. That's why they allow it to become so big. If this was a condition that made you very sick, you would come earlier to a doctor. So level one defects basically present late with advanced genital prolapse. And that's because the main complaint is bulge. Something is coming out. But there is some other conundrums with it. If the uterosacral cardinal ligaments break, you get what's called as total vaginal collapse. Everything falls out. But when everything falls out, the cervix remains normal in length. When the uterosacral cardinal ligaments are stretched instead of breaking, that's when you get elongation of the cervix. It might still present as something coming out of the vagina, but the two pathologies are totally different. Elongation of the cervix, is a competition between gravity and the ligaments. Total vaginal collapse is due to complete breakage of the ligaments. I don't know which textbook has ever told you this, but I've just written a book on it. So I'll show you the book sometime later. The mid vagina is a functional compartment. Because anteriorly you have the bladder, posteriorly you have the rectum. What is the bladder? What is the rectum? They are both storage organs. The bladder stores urine. The rectum stores McDonald's, KFC, whatever you eat, you know. Uh, so if an organ needs to be a storage organ, it needs to be expansible, expansible. And posteriorly, you need much more expansion because one day you'll eat chutney bhakti, next day you'll eat McDonald's. So the, the, the amount of uh, content in the rectum can vary from up to half a kilo. Plus it contains liquid, gas, and solid. We are going to talk about that in a minute. While the bladder only contains liquid. So when an organ needs to be stretchable, it is covered with fascia. No point in having a ligament there. The ligaments are rigid. So this is covered by fascia. The anterior bladder fascia is like a hammock. I don't know whether you must have hammocks everywhere where they tie the two ropes to the trees and then you have the sheet. So the bladder is held like a hammock while the rectum is actually attached in a craniochordal fashion. So the Cranial end is attached, blends into the uterosacral ligament, comes all the way down in the vagina and inserts itself into the perineal body. So if you get a rectocele, either the caudal end of the rectovaginal fascia has been detached or the cranial end of the rectovaginal fascia is detached. So when you have a posterior prolapse, you could have a high enterorectocele or a low rectocele isolated, no enterocele. It depends on where the sheet is torn, top end or bottom end, right? The hammock is a bit more complicated. It is complicated and that is the reason why anterior prolapse has the highest degree of recurrence. It is the best prolapse to slap the surgeon on the face and take their ego out. But you might think you've done a fantastic repair. Six weeks later, patient comes back and says, 
So the anterior prolapse is a big challenge. And it's one of the reasons why we invented the anterior hammock in 2004 called the perigee. Because the hammock can break in many places. It can break at the ropes. One rope can break, two ropes can break. The sheet can break in the midline or the sheet can break in the front or the sheet can break in the back. So you could get a unilateral paravaginal defect, a, bila a bilateral paravaginal defect, a midline defect, a proximal defect, and a distal defect. And if you combine those combinations, there's about 325 different ways you can get a cystocele. And the only operation we do is an anterior repair. No wonder it doesn't last very long. But the important part to remember is that when you have problems at level two, patients have symptoms, lots of symptoms, not just bulge. They will say, I can't empty my bladder properly. I'm getting recurrent urinary tract infections. If it's the anterior compartment, they will say, I can't empty my bowel properly. I have to put my fingers in the vagina to empty my bowel. That is characteristic of a rectocele. So you will not operate on a rectocele or a cystocele unless women actually have functional symptoms. That's very important for level two. Level three is even more complicated. Level three, actually, embryology. Embryology. So the upper two thirds of the vagina comes from the paramesonephric system. The lower one third comes actually from the Wolfian system or the genital urinary ridge. Why is that important? It's important because the lowest third of the vagina, urethra, anal canal, has got lots and lots and lots of blood supply, lots and lots and lots of nerve supply. So most of the sexual sensations come from the lower third. Most of the pain sensation comes from the lower third of the vagina. And what do they do? The urethra and the anal canal, they're the continence mechanisms. So the lower third of the urethra is perhaps, uh, lower third of the vagina is perhaps the most important part of the entire uh, vaginal canal. And yet it is the most neglected part when women are giving birth. It is the part that we hurt the most. It's the part that we neglect the most. So if we want to be true feminists, learn to love level three. That's my first lesson to you. I always tell my students, learn to love level three. Why? If the anterior compartment level three breaks, women get stress urinary incontinence, leakage when they cough, laugh, sneeze. 36% of women who give birth vaginally suffer from stress incontinence. You know why? Because we do not allow the genital hiatus to stretch properly, correctly. That's why you get dislocation of the ligaments. Posteriorly, the uh, Distal vagina has got the perineal body. The perineal body will divericate during vaginal childbirth if not reconstructed or supported properly. That will lead to vaginal looseness, vaginal flatus, and severe sexual dysfunction. Most women will not complain about it ever. But if you ask them, 26% of women who attend our urogynecology department will actually confess to having sexual dysfunction. And it is very sad that they are not allowed to enjoy sexuality, that they do it because they have to keep the husband happy. I think this is feminism gone wrong. We have to fight for her joy, her right to enjoy sexuality as well. It is not just a function she has to perform because she's a wife. And I missed Vaidehi's 50 not out because I'm going to talk about gender-based genital confidence and how we don't look after gender aging very well in women. We don't look after gender aging very well in women. So 
Um, I'm, I'm probably going to get your recording and see what, what we were trying to say, but we're going to have a chat about that. And finally, if level three sphincters go, external or internal anal sphincter, then you get fecal incontinence. Fecal incontinence, I would rather that a woman, the women tell me that they would rather be dead than have fecal incontinence. It's the ultimate degradation of a woman. So how much care do we take to really prevent fecal and platelet incontinence during childbirth? All these will be the last part of prevention during childbirth. A very interesting concept. I saw Evita showing a consent form for joint care of women by consultant. I think the time has come for us to actually take a consent for vaginal birth. You take a three-page consent for cesarean section. Why can't you take a consent for vaginal birth? Tell the women the truth and they will love you. Vaginal birth is no longer the default delivery system for women in 2021. You have to give patients, mothers, clients, I don't know what you call them, full disclosure or what can happen if you have a Caesar, what can happen if you have a vaginal birth. So another controversial topic to be talked about. Okay, so now you want to, you know the anatomy, you know the correlation with the anatomy. So like I said, long cervix, short cervix for level one, total vaginal collapse or cervical elongation. Level two, you have to have bladder symptoms, incomplete emptying, recurrent UTI, rectum symptoms, manual digitation, incomplete evacuation. Level three, incontinence symptoms, fecal, platelets, sexual symptoms, vaginal looseness, anorgasmia, uh, vaginal flatus. So we've got two out of three now. We've got the levels, we've got the symptoms. Now the last part is the most critical part, which is the staging. Lakshmi knows my pet hate. There is no such thing as a mild cystocele or a mild rectocele. That is only what I call bank balance prolapse. You operate on those only when you want a bigger car or you want your children to go to a private school with lots of fees. All right, so let's look at some basics. Listen to the patient. The patient is not there because she has nothing better to do in life. Chalo, aaj doctor ke baat jayenge. Shopping kyo karna jayenge? Doctor ke paas. Patients don't come because they have nothing better to do. Listen to them. They will tell you the story. They will tell you the story better if you keep listening. Don't interrupt them. Let them tell their story. Sometimes you think, oh, but she's talking, she's talking. There is a story in it. Don't ignore it. It's a very important story, but you have to, you have to listen to be patient, to listen. So please listen, okay? Um, look, very important to look. Look with your eyes, okay? And then feel with your hands. Three things you have to do. You don't need fancy equipment. Just listen to the patient, part the labia, look at the vagina and feel with your hands. I don't need any other equipment, only two gloves, and a patient in the dorsal position, comfortably covered. That is another very important thing. We tend to pull these sheets and expose the patients and it is terrible. As a man, I won't like it. I'm sure as a woman, they don't like it, but they put up with it because we don't care. If we care, your patient will be your best friend guiding you where the problem is so that you will have a combined solution. Very important. When you examine, just have a little checklist. I don't, you don't have to follow this checklist, but look at the genital hiatus. Normally the genital hiatus is closed. It's not wide open, okay? The urethral meatus is parallel to the floor. It's not pointing upward. That means it's got hypermobility. You look at the anterior compartment by pushing the posterior compartment down. Look at the posterior compartment by though at the end of Lift the anterior compartment, look at the posterior compartment. 
always ask the woman to strain, not cough. Coughing causes reflex contraction. I think you should all try it in the audience, including the men. Try and cough. Like, <coughs> if you cough, immediately there's a reflex contraction of the levator muscle. Not a good way to assess genital prolapse because it's pulling it back. You want to do a valsalva against a closed glottis. And so if you train the patient for one or two valsalvas first, and you ask them to take a breath, hold it, and push down, they sometimes release the breath. You say, no, let's try this again. Take a breath in and push down. That's a valsalva. Always report your findings at maximum valsalva. So what you see as a stage two prolapse at always means to me, you've seen it at maximum valsalva. Okay, so whatever stage you describe, you have to describe it at maximum valsalva. Only stage three and stage four are significant prolapses. These are prolapses, stage three is within one centimeter of the hymen. So it's coming down to at the hymen, okay? And stage four is one to two centimeters outside the hymen. Then it could be one foot long, it doesn't matter. But stage three and stage four prolapses require treatment. Not saying require surgery, require treatment. There is a very big study, prolonged study, I can tell you about it some other day, 25 years following women after vaginal birth or cesarean infection. The women who actually had graded stage two prolapse on maximum valsalva rated that as normal vaginal mobility. They had no symptoms. So if you see a woman straining and there is vaginal mobility, it's not pathology. It's normal vaginal mobility unless they have symptoms. So I think it's very important, those three things, level, stage, correlation with symptoms, very important, okay, good. And then you can do this complex, if you want to impress your Dr. Google patients, you can draw these pictures and say, oh, I've done a POPQ examination on you and you have got an AA of zero and a BA of zero, this is on the left side. This is a cystocele, this is a rectocele, but the cervix is at minus six and the GH, which is genital hiatus, perineal body are normal at uh, four. So what I'm really trying to say is, I don't think you necessarily have to do this. We do it because our research papers will not get published unless you have pre and post pop Q. What does it matter to the patient? Patient just wants to get better. Patient doesn't care if her AA is minus one. Is she better? If she's better, you've done your job. So I think that we have to look at women-focused care, not POPQ-focused care. It's not a operation care, but it's a Patient needs to be the person who says you've done a good job. Nothing else matters. Half the vagina will still be hanging out. Who cares? So I think it's important that we learn about women-centered care. You know, everyone, this is the, somehow it's this magical word that's come out in the last five years. We've been doing it forever. Patient's the most important person. Anyway, so before we jump into the next, uh, I've got about eight minutes. I just want to talk one minute about anorectal physiology, not understood very well, sadly, very sadly. All I'm trying to say is there is a dentate line at the anorectal junction. That has got the nerves. The dentate line is sampling the content of the rectum. It knows the difference between gas, liquid, and solid. So it always is sampling. What is in the rectum? Ah, KFC agya, McDonald agya. It knows what's going on, right? Not so much in women, but you know that men tend to pass wind in public very openly. But if you think about it, if you want to pass wind, what happens to your body? So the brain is saying, want to pass wind, it sends a direction to the dentate line. Dentate line says, yes, there is gas. So the brain will say, okay, 
you can pass it. What holds it? The internal anal sphincter maintains the resting anal pressure tone. It's always closed. It's autonomic sphincter, not voluntary. Always standing at guard, holding it. Now, the dentate line is saying gas needs to be passed. So the internal anal sphincter will relax and the gas will start coming out into the anal rectum. Okay? What if the dentate line got it wrong? Instead of gas, there is also liquid. Then there'll be a problem. All your clothes will be dirty. So if there is a mistake by the dentate line, the emergency sphincter is the external anal sphincter. Brain is saying, oh, there is liquid as well. Come on, send it back. That's when the external sphincter will squeeze send all the content back into the rectum and tell the dentate line that it has been a bad girl or a bad boy. What? The lesson from this is external anal sphincter is your emergency sphincter. Internal anal sphincter is your faithful sphincter 24 seven holding everything. Yet we spend 90% of our time repairing the external anal sphincter and less than 10% of the time looking after what is the most important part, which is the internal anal sphincter. So next time you think you have got a third degree tear, always repair the internal anal sphincter, even if you think it's not disrupted. Three interrupted sutures with your finger inside the anal canal, one in the top, one in the middle, one at the bottom, three zero monocryl, beautiful. The patient will thank you forever. Then you can do your overlap on end-to-end. Uh, -end. You can spend as much time as you want with the external sphincter. Remember, the physiology is important. You cannot change facts in life. Internal sphincter maintains continence. External sphincter is the emergency sphincter. So please spend more time with the internal anal sphincter from now on. That's lesson number two. First one was levels, stages, symptoms. Second one was childbirth trauma, internal sphincter repair is very important. The next is this pastime we have called urodynamics. A lot of people love doing urodynamics, colored lines, five lines, six lines, lots of money, et cetera, et cetera. I think urodynamics uh, should be a reconfirmation of your diagnosis. You make your diagnosis through history and examination. You reconfirm your diagnosis if you want through investigations. I would not allow any of my 400 trained doctors to ever order an investigation unless they have a diagnosis and they want to confirm it by ultrasound want to confirm it by urodynamics. I think urodynamics are only important if you have got a um, pretty mixed picture of urinary incontinence. Otherwise, it's not that vital. A good history and examination should solve most of the problems. Pelvic floor ultrasound, I think, is a better approach. We are using it because everyone's got an ultrasound. And all we're doing now is instead of putting the probe on the abdomen, we're putting it transparently in between the labia and you can see amazing stuff. You can see anterior compartment, mid compartment, posterior compartment, anorectal angle. Just start doing transparent ultrasound with a glove on top of the probe and some jelly in it. And after the 30th ultrasound, suddenly you'll start seeing things. It's like God has given you a vision. It helps a lot when you have difficulty saying, is this enterocele, is this rectocele? Is it a level two cranial defect, level two portal defect? So I would just say start practicing. The best thing that you could do is start practicing. That's the same way I've told Lakshmi to treat or teach all her doctors. If you can do a hysteroscopy, why can't you do a cystoscopy? You must. You must be really good at doing a cystoscopy. Not at two o'clock in the morning when you put a hole in the bladder during Caesar. But with every postmenopausal bleeding, hysteroscopy, do a cystoscopy afterward. Use the same goddamn telescope. It's no problem. Just don't put pressure on the bag. So learn, 
constantly keep enhancing your skills. Okay, then the next bit is how do you choose a primary procedure? I'm going to probably go five minutes extra, sorry. Um, please excuse me. Um, there is a very complex algorithm which talks about obliterative surgery, reconstructive surgery, anti-incontinence, which I will send you this, this is not difficult. I think it's very important for you to understand what is your skill level? That's also very important. We've done the diagnosis. And then I think, so for example, colpoclysis. How many of you do colpoclysis? I do a lot of colpoclysis now. Why? Because women are living longer. 83, 84 year old women lying in old age um, facilities, massive prosidentia, covered in feces, covered in urine, getting recurrent UTIs. All you want to do is just close the vagina, take that big lump away. It takes 15 minutes. It's an easy obliterative surgery that suffices the needs of that beautiful woman who doesn't deserve to have her prolapse being contaminated with feces or, or, and urine or both, you know? So I think it's important to sort of go through a little bit of checklist, what I want to do. But then there is the Rane algorithm always. There is always the Rane algorithm, which makes it simple. Check symptoms, check level, check stage. Is the prolapse cervix first or cervix last? Simple, only two types of prolapses in life. Either the cervix is coming first or the cervix is last, okay? If the cervix is first, is there cervical elongation? Does she want to retain fertility or not? But if there is cervical elongation, there is no treatment for cervical elongation. You have to take that cervix out or uterus out. But if she wants to retain fertility, you can do a suspensory operation, vaginally, laparoscopically, robotically, whatever. Patient will come back in five to 10 years and need to have it removed. So there's no permanent solution for cervical elongation. If cervix is last, avoid a vaginal hysterectomy. Avoid it by all possible means because we don't have this burger approach. One bread, two bread, put patties, put onion, put everything, you know, vaginal hysterectomy, anterior repair, posterior repair, perineoplasty, subureterus ring. Every woman doesn't need that whole package, right? So if the cervix is last, decide whether this is level two. If it's anterior level two, you have to add an apical repair. That's the only way you will get your recurrence rate down to 5%. If it's posterior, you can do whatever you want, put a few stitches, always heals beautifully. But don't forget surgeon aptitude. So your aptitude is what you know. You know how good you are or how bad you are. And if you feel that you're not confident enough, ask someone to come to your theater. I'm sure they'll give you a hand. Maybe give them a couple of gulab jamuns or whatever you want but always have mentors. Don't look at it as a defeat. I've invited someone else to look over me. I think it's very important. It gives you confidence, in fact, that everybody is doing the same thing. Then when we say, what are you going to do? There is a saying, this is lesson number three, okay? It's a simple lesson. You speak, that's the patient. You speak, I speak. You speak, we decide, you agree. You speak, I speak. You speak, we decide, you agree. How simple is this? Write it down on a wall in your clinic. Let the patient speak, then you speak. Then we, then she speaks again. Then we make a combined decision. And then she has to agree that that combined decision is in her best interest. That is counseling. That is informed consent. That is what matters. So remember, you speak, I speak, you speak, we decide, you agree. That's lesson number three. When you talk to patients, 
give them all the options. You say, first, you can do nothing. It's not going to kill you. Second, you can do conservative treatment. Just come and see me in six months. Let's see whether the prolapse gets worse, incontinence gets worse. Give her some vaginal estrogen. If she wants nothing else done, you can use pessaries and you can use surgery. But give all the options to the patient. What will the patient do? What do you think the patient does? does? She says, what do you recommend, doctor? Don't tell me that doesn't happen to you. Always happens. And that's when, you have to excuse me saying this, but that's when you have to look in your conscience and do what is called the mother test. What will you recommend for your mother? Then it is the correct answer. Maybe not mother-in-law, but mother definitely, you will always have the correct answer. So look within yourself for guidance. If this was my mother, what would I offer her? And you will get the answer. I am not ashamed to say this because this is what I do all the time. If the patient tells me, what do you recommend? I go back inside me and find out what, what would I do? What would I do? Okay. Good. Like I said, there's numerous things that you could do for level one. The sacral colpopexy, ileocoxygia, sacrospinous, uterosacral ligament fixation, hysterectomy, macaul. Like I said, level two, you have to do anterior corporopy, paravaginal repair. You can do, uh, but you have to add an apical repair. Posteriorly, you do colporopy site specific or transanal posterior repair. Only colorectals do it. Don't do it. Not so good. Colpoclysis, very important. You must look at YouTube, simple colpoclysis. And of course, level three. Level three is the biggest problem. Perineoplasty, or because otherwise they're all going to have laser for their vaginal tightening and rejuvenation. And now there are a few studies that is questioning the whole modality. Um, Mid-urethral slings or birch colpo suspension or a facial sling for incontinence. So there's numerous surgical options. Okay. Like I said, there is no evidence to support taking the uterus if it is cervix last prolapse, okay? Remember, there are only simple tips and tricks. I'll be finishing very soon, Lakshmi. If I'm really late, I can stop now. But operate only on stage three and stage four prolapses. Beware of asymptomatic prolapse. If the prolapse is asymptomatic, it's probably normal, leave it alone. Beware of the invisible prolapse. So I know this is a funny story, but you can have a patient, she comes with medical prolapse, prolapse, you examine her, sitting, standing, morning, afternoon, after gym, before gym, you know, can't see the prolapse. If you cannot see prolapse after all those attempts, send the patient to your worst enemy because this patient is never going to get better. So maybe you have a little black book and you say, oh, I will send you to this fantastic doctor. But that's not true. You shouldn't be doing that. Okay. Vaginal mobility is normal. A mobile vagina doesn't mean a prolapsed vagina. So I think it's very important. I'm not going to go through the prolong on sweep up study, but I just want to spend the last two minutes with um, showing you this great man. Uh, this is Professor... Dennis Mukwege, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, who changed my life completely. Dennis has looked after 56,000 women for genital reconstruction after gender-based rape, ranging from nine months of age to 90 years of age. It is only a blessing of God that I got to Dennis to become my friend and that I can work with him. He has made my life. So I thank him. You should read about Dennis. His best friend took a bullet for him to save him because he was doing so much good work so that he could continue to do his good work. He's an amazing person. Uh, of course, one of the proudest moments of my life was when Dennis came to my hospital and took a photograph with my family. This is what life is all about. It's, a, it's introducing your children to a godlike person. You know, uh, it's not his father, it's this man. Um, so they are so proud of having this photograph with Dennis McWagan.
but also in life, it is very important to have fun. And having fun makes you actually look after yourself better. I am 10 times healthier in my 50s than I was in my 30s and 40s. And I do bodybuilding. Why? Because I feel that self-image, first, we have to make our own image good if we want to look at a nice image in our patient. Do unto others what you would do to yourself. Doctors are the worst people look to look after themselves. We just work, work too hard, always under pressure, always having hypertension, metabolic syndrome, worrying. This has to stop. This has to stop. And it will only stop through self-realization. India is the country of yoga. India is the country of mindfulness. India is the country of origin for meditation. I don't want white people telling me what to do. The Indians are the people who know this. It came from them. I don't want to hear it from white people. So we need to go back to our heritage and be proud of it and use it for our well-being. Finally, old dogs. Can old dogs learn new tricks? So Lakshmi, you might be pleased to hear that I'm now a trained robotic surgeon. In the last four, year, four months, I trained very hard on the robot. Uh, and I don't know. I think it was not so much the robot. It is, there is no age for you to learn new things. There is no age. And I think you've got to challenge yourself all the time. So there is absolutely no age barrier. I think that gender-based genital aging is very, very poorly looked after. I think women definitely have accelerated gender-based aging or accelerated genital aging after in the, in the perimenopause. We don't look after it very well. We want them to get to a state where the vagina is totally dry, where they don't sleep, they've got vasomotor dysfunction, they've gone completely mad, then you want to treat it. Why can't we do it the other way around and say, let's not get you there, madam. Let's actually support you through this difficult phase of accelerated gender-based aging. And you don't need to always give HRT, but certainly topical estrogen. Certainly herbal remedies. These are the best ways to start helping women with gender-based genital aging, which is definitely accelerated in women than in men. That also goes to prove that God was probably a man because he keeps women alive till the 80, 85, but he takes away their ovarian function at 55. I don't know what the logic is but I disagree with it. I completely disagree with it. And the last concept I want to run past is the newest concept, which is probably the oldest concept. You see, Suvana Joshi was doing her hair. Betty's got her makeup on, beautiful glasses and everything. We look at ourselves with confidence, right? That's why we do what we do, because we like what we see. Who ever talks about gender confidence, genital confidence? Women are the worst about genital confidence. And then if something else precipitates, maybe someone says something or menopause comes, the confidence is zero. And we are not even willing to ask them, how confident do you feel about your genitals? doctor, But really, actually, she likes it because she needs help. We are supposed to be a partnership. You have to say, I respect you, and I want you to be a complete human being, not a subservient person that doesn't get equal pay, that gets raped, that gets gang raped, that has to suffer incontinence, childbirth trauma, no more. 
no more. This is what we have to do. We have to fight for every single bit. Why should pads and tampons have luxury tanks? Why do women have to wait outside the toilet for hours while men don't have to wait? This is discrimination against women. Don't worry about flying airplanes. Let's come to some basics. 9% of men in the world take responsibility for contraception. 9% only. Shame on us men. 91% of the times is the women that have to carry the burden of reproductive choices. Why? And why are we not making a big noise about it? But I am. I'm not going to be quiet till I die. But we will keep fighting this fight. I want you all to join me in celebrating the extraordinary with your heart. Thank you. Ooh. Mangal Madam, your comments and then I will say finally something about Ajay. I can stop Mangal sharing. Sir. Yeah, please. Yes, Where is Mangal Madam? Ah. Unmute Kariya, Madam. Ajay sir, extraordinarily beyond ordinary sir this was. Never seen, never ever seen a male feminist like you. I salute you sir. Absolutely you. fantastic. I mean it. So by the time Mangal Madam locks in, Ajay, it was simply mesmerizing. Amo, please and unmute ma'am Mangala ma'am. I think she's, she's not able to Every unmute. time I hear you, Ajay, you make me envy your mentees. I really wish to go back to my postgraduate days and have you as my PG teacher and my mentor. I wish I can do that. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> and really, I really want you as my uh, PG teacher and mentor. And you are my Dennis, Ajay. Looking at your work, which is really commendable in its own thing, I wish I can nominate you for Nobel uh, Prize. I mean, I really wish to see you as the you. recipient because I know, I mean, I really don't know how many of the audience knows, but more than your Eurogynic work, I know you as a male feminist and I am very happy. Please keep motivating these youngsters and please keep speaking about your this side of the life so that more and more male are motivated to join your bandwagon. I mean, we yes. really need more and more uh, male feminist uh, budget. So uh, please don't talk only on urogynec. Now I <laughs> labeled you as a dawn and somebody in the audience labeled you as god of urogynecology. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. Scary. God of Man, that's me. That's me. That's me. god <laughs> namaskar. Yes. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That's why Mangal Madam is calling Mangal Madam, sir. Um, Dr. Rani, your lecture was on procedures, practices, and protocols in urogynecology. I will describe your lecture as perfect, powerful, and priceless. Thank you. And you are very precious and a proficient urogynecologist yet a very polite surgeon. Sir, we all are proud of you. Thank you very much for such a fantastic, mesmerizing, inspiring lecture for us. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I Ajay, wish... Just a minute. Ajay, you're not supposed to leave. His no, humility no. always amazes me, friends. I don't know how he can be so humble looking at the amount of the work, looking at his academics, and my God, his biodata is 27 pages long. He has got so many publications, textbooks, research articles, and this feminist side of Professor Ajay Rane. You deserve a standing ovation, Ajay. I mean, really, if I would have been in the hall, everyone would have stood up and given you a standing ovation. So I'm so happy and proud that you could visit Nagpur, though virtually, and you have inspired and motivated uh, us all. So thank you so much. I know you are a very busy person, Not but all. we thank all you. are sincerely thankful to you for gracing this platform. I it's wish special. all thank of you, you the very best um, for Nogs. And I see Parag Biniwale is also in there. So yeah. hi, Parag. Um, he's uh, an amazing friend and colleague. So uh, 
really um, thank you. Thank you so much for the special, opportunity. Special and, uh, thanks, course, Professor Rane. Special thanks for realigning, readjusting, rescheduling your flight for us. Thank you so much. <laughs> no worries. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sir.